Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR. I am really excited to talk to you today because we have a new visualization for wet bulb temperature. And this isn't just a situation where we've been able to port and more clearly show existing NCA5 data. This is the first time we've really been able to make it dance. And I think that that is so cool that we are telling a new story with the publicly available data sets. But first, let's get on the same page about what wet bulb temperatures are, what that means. All right, don't worry, folks. I'm going to make this quick. Stick with me and we'll get to the tool. But first, we got to talk about what is wet bulb. We're talking about life-threatening heat calculated by percentage humidity and temperature. You might have heard heat index if you pay attention to the weather. That's a similar measure where we've got a feels-like measure that can be way hotter than the mercury on the thermometer. If, like me, you like to hoard ancient thermometers. Wet bulb temperatures start around 95 degrees in high humidity. That is lower than some people might think that you could be talking about life-threatening heat at 95 degrees, especially for small children and old people, people with cardiac conditions, that can be true. And unfortunately, we're all made of meat, so we can get so hot we cook in wet heat or in dry. If you can't sweat, like in a very humid environment, you're going to cook faster. Very rare steak starts at a dry 120. You might have seen that we're seeing temperatures like in Australia, like in Southeast Asia, where they're hitting 120 F. So we're talking about really serious needs for cooling in a warmer world. I think it's also important to address some wet bulb misconceptions. A lot of people are worried that wet bulb temperatures might make you instantly die because of how this is talked about in a get clicks fashion in many climate spaces. When we're talking about wet bulb temperatures, we're talking about health risks that increase at a population level. And we're talking about health risks that are already present, that we're already facing today in many parts of the world. There's also a misconception that we cannot prepare for wet bulb temperatures, but actually many climate specific resilience strategies can help us get ready for this threat that's coming so that we can continue to live safely in our homes and our communities. But we need to be aware of the risk factors that we're facing. So if you're a person who's been really freaked out about wet bulb, let's try to chill out as we get into looking at this visualization because it's gonna be scary. So you should try and get your baseline low before we look at the tool because this tool also has some limitations. I wanna talk to you a little bit about our methods and limitations before I present it. The key concept that I need you to think about before we look at the visualization is duration versus intensity. If you've watched any of my state level forecasts, you know that when we look at changes to the winter, we talk about cold loss in terms of weeks and about intensity of cold loss, where we talk about raising winter lows. I want you to think about that as we're talking about this heat tool. This tool for wet bulb risk measures risk duration, how much longer in the year it might be possible for wet bulb temperatures to occur. Within that risk duration window, your risk is gonna intensify depending on how humid your climate is. So for this tool, I want you to think about this as more a tornado watch tool than a tornado warning tool. This is gonna show you the broad expanse of risk duration that you could be facing in your area around wet bulb at 1.5C, where we are now, and at 2C, our next threshold for change. The way that we calculated risk duration, and this is, is my concept, so don't blame Dustin for this one. I had to think about what could we do with our current data sets, which do not include humidity, which is a key component for calculating wet bulb temperature. So here's what I thought we should do. I thought that we should identify risk factors pretty broadly. So from the NCA5 data sets, I thought that we should look at, does the county level data show increased total days over 95, increased nights over 70, and increased annual precipitation? Because all of those are gonna be strong but indirect predictors when they come together of wet bulb conditions. So if all three of those factors are on for your county, if that's so, we're turning the risk on, and then we're seeing how long all three of those are on and visualizing that in the visualization. So that's what we're talking about, is tornado watch level for wet bulb temperature watch 
and the duration of that projected at 1.5 and 2. Just two slides left. We're almost done. So it's important you know with the limitations that the lowest level of risk duration is not zero. There's no place in the US where there's zero risk of wet bulb temperature conditions, especially as we move into a warming world. And everyone should consider the potential for life-threatening heat as a resilience element in a warming world. But it's very different if you're gonna be dealing with one day of relatively mild wet bulb conditions, say 95 degrees with high humidity versus an additional month where you might be at 120. Those are very different preparedness scenarios. As we look at the visualization, it's also important to remember that risk intensity is gonna vary by humidity. So well, Alabama and Arizona are gonna show similar risk duration on this visualization, Alabama's risk intensity is likely to be much higher with its humid climate. Desert climates, those dry climates where usually your high heat is not paired with rain, you're going to be more worried about a temporary sous vide incident after a monsoon. So high peaks of risk over a long, low risk period of duration. Makes sense? Let's check it out. Folks, I think this is just so cool. Because, you know, I can't program. I have a very limited ability with HTML and that's it. So when I look at multiple levels of data and I have to overlay them in my mind, I don't have any way to show people. But what Dustin made here, this really shows the wet bulb risk that I felt was there in the data. And now it's here and I can show it to you all. And that is so cool. So I like the way that we have this colored in here and I hope that everyone can see it okay. We can see that at 1.5, which is where we are now, there are parts of Texas that really need to be highlighted as particularly dangerous areas. And I want to point out on this key, you know, I said verbally that risk level zero doesn't mean it'll never occur, right? We need to be aware as we build climate resilience that there is no perfect place, no perfectly safe place. When we're talking about risk level zero, we're talking about less than three increased days occurring a year projected at 1.5 is this map and 2C is this map. If you're at risk level one, that means less than a week. Risk level two, between one and two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and four plus. Those of you who looked at our um, total heat map, at Dustin's total heat map, saw that there is a dramatic increase, much larger than many of us would have been able to understand without the visualization. The hot season increase between 1.5C and 2C basically doubles across the map. And we can see that wet bulb risk also has an enormous spread, an enormous increase in the size of the risk between 1.5 and 2C. I personally think that if you are at risk level three or below, you're in a situation where we're gonna experience more of what you'd call transient wet bulb temperatures, where the type of cooling solutions that our society currently uses, a mixture of passive and active cooling solutions, will be an effective way to build resilience. But as you move into the purple and red territory, you're really talking about a situation where deep resilience is gonna be necessary for public health and human safety. As we look at this magnified purple and red territory, at 2C, in the conditions where we're not there yet, but we do appear to be heading there faster than we'd like to be, we see a need for redundancy in cooling systems to protect people. Because if the power goes out in this future, this is gonna be a lot of people at risk of death. It's pretty serious. I wanna talk just a little bit about some of these hot spots on the map and the difference between their risk duration and their risk intensity. In Idaho here, we've talked about Boise before as sort of having a new Phoenix-like climate. That at 2C, its climate is going to resemble Phoenix in the 90s. We see it here 
at a very high risk level for wet bulb temperatures because of the long duration. It's worth noting that in Boise, we see very, very little rain during the season where temperatures would allow for wet bulb conditions if humidity went up. So though you have a long risk duration in Boise, you have a low risk intensity. I want people to be thinking that that's off the table. When we look at the other growing hotspots of highest risk, we are talking about in areas that I'm most concerned about, the potential for the dry heat alone to get you. When we look at the center of this hotspot here, the sort of Maricopa County and growing hotspot, we're talking about an area where there's an additional month of temperatures over 105 projected. You may know they already have a lot of temperatures over 105. So we're talking about just a very extreme heat scenario. And we're talking about that same thing in this spot radiating out of Texas. We're talking about heat that is already very extreme. We're talking about more frequent humidity events, and we're talking about a tremendous extension in heat duration, as well as this extension that we see here in wet bulb temperature risk. If you want to think about what you need to prepare for now, we are currently over 1.5C. The most recent figures from April indicate that we're at 1.58C. That's from the Copernicus Institute. So take a look at this figure and assess your risk now. Think about if your family could handle that level of life-threatening heat for that duration with your current resilience measures. You're going to need to assume that you have a higher risk intensity if you live in a humid climate than in an arid climate. And if, like me, you're interested in building resilience for the long haul, I think that this 2C wet bulb risk figure is very informative in terms of decisions for where you might want to move. I personally want to stay at or below risk level three. And if you're building resilience in place, it's really important to know what you're up against and the level of risk duration you're going to be facing, because that is really attached to the level of cooling redundancy that you are going to need. I want to show you, we do have this tool that the government recently developed for near-term wet bulb forecasting. Look, we can see that over the next few days, here in May, we are expecting a high risk of wet bulb temperatures to occur in that part of Texas where our risk is most elevated, as well as in Florida. I think it's important to note that we are developing the tools that we need to prepare for long-term resilience and to keep an eye on what's going on in the near-term weather conditions so that we can put the icing on the cake, as it were, if a big heat dome is coming and you know it's time for your family to be able to get to ground if you need to. I think that this tool represents a meaningful step forward in our ability to communicate about and begin to build appropriate resilience in different parts of the U.S. And I feel like we get enough negative news that's faster than expected. I was hoping to be able to begin distributing community resilience awards in the fall, but thanks to you all's insanely generous support of American resiliency, when at the end of the Colorado video, I asked for some donations to help repair my car, I asked for $750. You maniacs gave $3,300 and you didn't stop when I told you that my needs were met. And I'm just blown away by the support of this community. I think that it's time already, faster than expected, to begin giving back to people who are really helping to build resilience in our community. Every month, starting now, the pool is full. I'm gonna be giving up to a $500 award to outstanding members of the American Resiliency community who have given us tools, methods, or inspiration to help build resilience on the ground. Dustin, you are guaranteed a $500 reward Let's talk. I'll send you a check. I'll PayPal you. You let me know what works. If you want to give, there's a pinned comment at the bottom of this video. You can help me refill that award pool and any overflow that we get in the next week, it is going to Dustin. His family is moving. They are moving from a high risk area to a low risk area at the end of this month. And he's still put in the hours to help us visualize this risk. And you all know, there is no young family that doesn't need a little bit of moving help. So I think this is a great opportunity to give back to a volunteer who has given so much for us. If you give through the pinned comment, you should know AR is a 501c3. 
you will receive a tax receipt with our tax information. Let's keep this rolling. I want to hear more amazing stories and offer more amazing tools from the AR community to the AR community. Let's do it. Let's get ready together. The future is scary, but we can do the best we can as fast as we can. We can ramp this up faster than expected. Folks, thanks so much for all your support of AR. The donors, the volunteers, the active community members who are spreading the word online and doing the work on the ground. You all are awesome. We are building what we need right here. Let's keep it up, folks. Let's get ready. Talk with you all again soon.